Okay, let's have a look in this screen cam at the problems you have in impedances. Okay, if we just have a look at this circuit just for the moment, we've got a standard inverting amplifier, um, V out over V in, if we were to write that, would give us our AV, in this case it would be minus RF over R in to a first approximation. So effectively that's showing you how the gain calculates. Uh, that's a minus and that's a plus on here. We have a problem here though, okay? We have our input, okay, forming a signal from a source component. So imagine this component is a microphone, okay? The microphone's got a ground connection and it's got your signal connection. The microphone itself has got effectively a series impedance. So it's going to have some kind of value. That's modelled here by RS. We've now got our gain equation in our operational amplifier with an input impedance which tends towards R in as a limit. Therefore, if R, if R in is substantially greater than RS, no problem. AV is OK. However, if R in is significantly less than RS, your AV is going to be massively reduced. If R in equals RS, you might get maximum power transfer theorem, but your AV is probably going to be around about half. Why? Because this signal here is effectively V in. And we would be able to write V in is equal to Vs as a function of R in over R in plus RS. key problem that we have in this design um, is the fact that because we've got this input signal, this microphone or whatever, with a source impedance, you're driving into this input impedance, so you're going to lose energy. So you might build this circuit for whatever voltage is coming off here for a target voltage, so you've got your gain set correctly, but then you lose energy in, in here. As a quick example of that, we can do a little bit of maths and show that happening. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to show the effect of those two there. Really, really straightforward. My input signal is V in, my source is Vs, my R in over R in plus Rs gives me my loss effectively down here. If you then multiply that term as V in in here, you end up with your gain equation actually having significant losses. So if you've got V out over Vs, you would effectively have your minus RF over RN, and then you'd multiply by RN over RN plus RS. Okay, so you can see clearly how the actual gain is changing as a function of that source impedance. So what do we do about it? Do we just ignore it? Do we account for losses? Two things. You could take that equation, the gain equation, and you could compensate for the losses. So if you calculate your gain, Okay, and you've set your value of R in at say two kilo ohms. Okay, so if this number was two kilo ohms after you've set your gain, let's say this one is 200 kilo ohms. So your gain is 100. Um, you got 10 millivolts coming off the sensor. If this impedance here is one kilo ohm, what's going to happen? Well, 1k is driving into 2k, so you've effectively got um, two over two plus one, so you've got two over three. Okay, you've effectively got two thirds of your 10 millivolts coming in. So your voltage signal coming in here is going to be around the 6.6 .6 millivolts. Okay, so when you multiply by through your gain, your output signals are not going to be the value that you wanted of 10 volts. It's going to be around about 6.6 .6 volts, okay, instead of 10 volts. So you can quickly see that you've got a problem because of that loss. You could increase the gain by adjusting that resistor. I think that's suboptimum. What do we really want to do? Okay, so this circuit gives us a few advantages. First off, we don't have to have uh, the input signal um, coming in through R1. R1 can be a very high impedance, but doesn't have to control the gain. To do that, we've effectively got uh, this voltage divider in the feedback path of this design. So here, these components are effectively reducing the output signal from uh, the output terminal V out proportional to R3 over R4 to create a feedback which can then come into R1, R2. So I tend to think of this as being the area where we're controlling the gain and these two are effectively controlling the input impedance. 
just for clarity, this node is ground, this node is ground, positive terminal, negative terminal. OK, so let's write some basics on here, see exactly how this all fits together. If we write VDM, OK, the voltage difference here is going to be a function of V out divided by A. So whatever the output signal is, divided by the open loop gain. Therefore, V out over infinity equals zero. If we want to look at this current coming in here, one, I1, so our input current, I1, what does that equal? We've got V in here and VDM here. So we've got V in minus VDM all divided by our R1 impedance. Okay, And as we've just proven here, VDM effectively is zero because if our open loop gain is infinity, we've got no value. So in effect, we can throw away the value of VDM in this, uh, in this case. Remember, analog is an approximation. So that's V in over R1. <coughs> as VDM tends towards zero, no current is going to flow in the op amp. We'll also make that assumption as well. This current flow here is irrelevant, therefore I1 will flow up here and there'll be no flow into the operational amplifier. These are small approximations which generally will be valid. Let's write out I2, the current flowing here. I2 is equal to effectively I1 as we've just proven, therefore that is V in over R1. If we have a look now and try and think about what's happening at Vx, this node here of our circuit, we've got it labelled here, Vx, what is happening there? Okay, we have Vx is equal to, well, we could look at Vdm, this voltage here, minus I2, R2. Okay, minus I2, R2. So you've now calculated the, the voltage at this node. Okay. Now we also know that VDM is equal to zero, and I2 is effectively the same as I1, so we can now write V in R2 over R1. Okay, which simplifies down to minus R2 over R1 V in. Let's have a look at I3 current I3. Well, current I3 is at this node. Okay, Current I3 is from here to ground. So if we go from, as we've directed, put the direction of currents here, go 0 minus Vx over R3, we will calculate I3. Okay, Now we can substitute in the value of Vx here that we've found. So we can put that into this expression. And it, uh, this is a negative, this is a negative, this becomes positive. So we've now got R2 over R1, R3, V in. OK. So we've now got our I3 current and our I2 current. We can now write out our I4 current. OK. And our I4 current is I3 plus I2, which in this case is now R2 over R1, R3. V in plus V in over R1. OK, so we've got lots of currents there all defined. If we have a quick check, we have defined I1, our input current. There's our I1. We've defined I2 being I1. We've defined I3. And we've now defined I4. So we've got four currents flowing around in this design. I'm going to move to another page. And we'll keep those equations in mind. I'll write them out back again at the beginning. And then we'll actually substitute them all back in. So keeping the circuit in mind up here, we had um, I1 is equal to I2, which is equal to V in over R1. We've got I3 is equal to R2 over R1, R3. V in, and we've got I4 is equal to I3 plus I2, which is equal to R2, R1, R3, V in, 
plus V in over R1. Okay. Um, now we need to just know what V out is. Well, V out is equal to whatever Vx is, okay, minus I4 uh, R4. Okay, so let's write that one out. Okay, so let's substitute in. So we have minus R2 over R1 V in minus into R2 R1 R3 V in plus V in over R1 R4. Okay. So all we've done is we've substituted everything into that expression. So we've written out our Vx term uh, in here. We've written our I4, and then we've written put, uh, put our R4 in there. So there's our value for V out as a function of V in. If we simplify and we want V out over V in, okay, we now get minus R2 over R1 minus R4 R2. R1, R3, minus R4 over R1. Okay. Now, if we realise that we're actually really interested in R2 over R1, because normally we have our input, uh, our equation will be feedback resistor over our input resistor. So, if we take that out as like a common factor, we will get minus R2 over R1 into 1 plus R4 over R3 plus R4 over R2. Okay, we've got that. We've now calculated our gain equation for this circuit. Now this is really useful. Let's just quickly inspect that. I'm just going to change colour just for a moment on my screen here and go for blue. Let's just have a think. Here, if we set R1 and R2 to be 1 mega ohms, this input impedance is now dominated by the value of R1 because this is a virtual earth and effectively a short circuit the same as the other. There are other factors with the feedback factor which would increase that one but with one mega ohm here you've got a substantive value that's what you want to do. So if we set that value to one mega ohm, if we set R2 to one mega ohm as well, both of these values okay the only variables that are left for you know is R4 over R3. Okay, If we look at the gain equation, we want our gain to be, say, 100. This is simply unity. So as a scaling entity, we have the 1 plus R4 over R3 plus R4 over 1 meg. Okay, If R4 is small and this is large, this term effectively becomes quite small. This is our key to setting our gain in our design. So if we do that, we really have controlled our value of input impedance, but we've also got the gain that we want. So this is a very, very good solution. So if you have some kind of sensor with a high impedance, okay, and you're feeding into some kind of amplifier design, you want to make sure that you can have a high Z here, or even a very high Z here. Therefore, you will not have any losses to account for. Otherwise, you need to account for losses in your signal. So I hope this little run through looking at the high impedance structure is of benefit to you. Of course, we could put some numbers in here and we'd do some calculations and we'd set some values. One of the key ways we would do that, we've set these to one mega ohms. So your input factor here, you've defined your one mega ohms. Um, if you're thinking about in loss terms as well, I, I would want to lose less than 1% of signal. So if you kept it two orders of magnitude greater. Okay, so for example here, uh, if, if, you, if you've got one mega ohm coming in, you, this could go up to 10 kilo ohms and you'd still be okay. You've got, a, you've got a reasonable, you've got two orders of magnitude before you hit anything. Therefore you're down in a 1% error or loss value. Okay. Again, you could count for that in the gain calculation, you could overcompensate, but it does work really well. So rule of thumb, two orders of magnitude keeps it away. 
if you're doing some designs you would simply set the value of R4 to a value, calculate R3, put it in, see if they come out reasonable. Typical starting point might be set that around 10k ohms, calculate your R3. This term effectively will be known. You've got 10k over 1 meg, so you've got you know a very small number. Plus the 1, this is going to give you the gain ratio factor that, that will be the, what's of interest to you in your design. Okay, So that's where I would tackle it. Um, examples to follow.